Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah. I missed you last week. Uh, at the end of the last episode, I talked about rescheduling and um, all of that wonderful stuff that happens in people's lives, and we did not end up having an episode last week. Um, still working on rescheduling the one author, and my life just got a little crazy with other things last week. I, I did want to do something in terms of an episode, and that did not happen, so I am sad. And I missed talking with an author and with you, my lovely listeners, so that's just how life works sometimes. I hope that you are having a good week. Hope you had a great weekend. Um, stayed warm. I know, it's January and some places are cold. It's been a weird winter. Very, very weird. Like, there was a 70 degree temperature difference. Both my mom and my sister texted me. Um, oh no, I was talking to my mom on the phone and then my sister texted me and said, it's 70 degrees warmer than the last time we talked about the weather because it was negative 30 and then the high was supposed to be 40 today, I think. So that's, that's always crazy. And then the high here is supposed to be 70 tomorrow. <laughs> and so if it, if it was negative, if, if that happened on the day that my mom and my sister were at negative 30, that is a hundred degree temperature difference, which just feels wrong. But, um, yeah, I don't know. It, it, it's kind of crazy. We had an okay weekend. I worked a lot this weekend and got some stuff done that needed to get done. I still have many, many things that also need to get done. I, but I also took time out from the the things that, you know, that have to get done that aren't always fun and did some things just for me. I read, I crocheted, I, you know, hung out with the hubby and the puppies and because the weather's been so nice, we are going for our daily walks again. And because my hubby's finally feeling better, we are going for our daily walks again. We went today and met a lovely young family, uh, baby mom and grandma from the Czech Republic. Those were the first people here that we had met from the Czech Republic. I think I've mentioned this before, but I have a friend that I send texts to after we've gone for our lunchtime walk with the dogs and say, uh, we had a lovely walk today. Today we met people from Germany, from England, from, <laughs> I like to list the countries because my husband is very, very extroverted and he loves to, to meet people and chat them up. Whereas I would smile and probably just keep walking. He likes to talk to people. So today we met a lovely family from the Czech Republic and had not met someone specifically on our walks from Czech, Rep- Czech Republic. So that was new and um fun we talked about where we should go where we should go if we ever do visit the Czech Republic which is on our list of course i would love to see prague and um they live in i can't remember the name of the city breen does that sound right something like that she said they live near the second largest city so i will look it up but she said that is beautiful and so someday it's on the it's on that list that list that might be longer, well, at least equivalent to my TBR, just all the places that I want to go visit someday. So that was my afternoon walk. And now here I am with you to bring you an author interview. Today I am speaking with author Edward Cahill about his historical fiction novel, Disorderly Men. Let me go ahead and give you the description of that book. And actually, before I give you the description, I will tell you that Disorderly Men, this is um, from the Amazon description, is the winner of the 2023 Best Indie Book Award 
uh, for LGBTQ2 fiction. It is on Lambda's literary, Lambda, excuse me, it is on Lambda Literary Review's September Most Anticipated list, and it is one of Queer 40's best pride reads for summer 2023. So that, um, that's very cool. Those are some very cool accolades. Now, the description of the book. Three gay men in pre-Stonewall New York City find their fates thrown together in the police raid of a village bar. Roger Morehouse is a Wall Street banker and West Chester family man with a pre- preciously guarded secret. As the shouting begins and flashlights blaze in his face, the life he's carefully curated over the years, a fancy new office overlooking Lower Broadway, a house in Beachmont Woods, his wife and children, is about to come crashing down around him. Columbia literature professor Julian Prince lives a comparatively uncloseted life when he finds his first committed relationship tested to its limits. How could he explain to Gus, a fearless young artist, that he couldn't stay with him that weekend because the woman who was still technically Julian's fiance would be visiting? But when Gus is struck unconscious by a police baton, Julian comes out of hiding to protect him, even if exposure means losing everything. For Danny Duffy, an Irish kid from the Bronx, with a sassy mouth and a diverse group of friends, the raid is a galvanizing Spartacus moment. Danny doesn't have too much left to lose. His family has just disowned him. But once his name appears in the newspaper, he'll be fired from his job at Sloan Supermarket, where he's risen to assistant manager of produce, and begin a journey that veers between political enlightenment and violent revenge. The three men find themselves in a police wagon together. Their hidden lives threaten to be revealed to the world. Blackmail, a private investigator, Gus's disappearance, and Danny's quest for retribution propel disorderly men to its piercing conclusion as each man meets the boundaries of his own fear, love, and shame. The stakes for each are different, but all of them confront a fundamental question. How much happiness is he allowed to have, and what share of it will he lay claim to? That is, I love how detailed that description is. That is a very detailed description of Disorderly Men. You get a good snapshot of each of the three main characters, Danny, Julian, and Roger, and what drives them. This is definitely a character-driven novel, and Edward talks a little bit about that during our interview. You really get to find out what is making these men... um what propels them in their decision making, why they have lived their lives the way they have up until this point. This is, I think, 1962, as it said, pre-Stonewall. So life for the queer community was very, very different. You had to be incredibly closeted in a lot of ways. I mean, the, the book opens with a police raid on a bar where a number of men are arrested for being gay. They're arrested for lewd acts in public. For There's a whole slew of charges that are brought against them, but it's because they are gay. That's the only reason they're arrested. And in some ways, it's so hard to imagine that life. I mean, unfortunately, it's not hard to imagine that in, in other ways because of the things we hear in the news all of, all the time. But we have made progress. And so to, ju- to be arrested just for being in a bar and being perceived as gay is to me astounding. And so this is historical fiction, but it's really important to understand what came before and what led people to fight for the rights that the LGBTQIA plus community has now and is continuing to fight for. So this is, it's character driven. So you really get to see into the minds of these three men, what drives them, what compels them, etc. So let's go ahead and let Edward talk about the book and the writing of the book. Again, it is called Disorderly Men. Let's go to the interview. Hello, Edward. Welcome to the podcast. Hello, Sarah. Very nice to be here. It's nice to have you here. I am happy to have you and excited to talk about your book, Disorderly Men. Before we do that, though, um, if you wouldn't mind sharing just a little bit about yourself so my listeners can get to know you, that would be great. Sure. I am a fiction writer and English professor uh, based in New York City. Uh, I teach at Fordham University. I've been there for 19 years, and I started writing fiction about eight years ago. Wonderful. And before we started recording, we were just talking about New York, uh, the weather, etc. But um, 
I, I don't know. I, I have a, a romantic notion of living in New York. I'm not sure I actually could do it. <laughs> One of the best things, I mean, there's so many things in New York that uh, that call uh, me. Uh, it's not an easy place to live, but there are so many writers in New York. And I think that's one of the reasons that I stay. I love the museums and I love uh, I love all the, you know, the other culture. But there are a lot of writers in New York and it's really nice to have writers at my uh, at my disposal. Sure. Yeah, because writing can be very isolating. So it's nice to have them close, I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah. You know, sharing manuscripts, uh, talking shop. Um, and just, uh, uh, you know, having, having, you know, other models for, for how to, how to have a writing life and how to be productive without driving yourself crazy. Very important. Yes. Um, well, in terms of the book, it is called Disorderly Men. Can you give an overview of that story? Sure. Um, it's about three men who are arrested in the police raid of a gay bar in Greenwich Village in 1962. Um, and it follows their lives for about two weeks uh, thereafter as they uh, as that event um, really just kind of brings uh, brings uh, brings them to a, a precipice where they have to decide how uh, how important their happiness uh, is and uh, how important living honestly is. Uh, so in, in a lot of ways, um, it's it's three coming out stories. Um, although coming out in 1962 means a lot means something different than I think it does now. Um, uh, but it in, it's, you know, there's a, a touch of noir, a touch of classic melodrama. Um, I think a lot of deep character, um, but also, uh, a pretty action packed plot. And the fact that it starts with this, with this raid and the arrest of not only these three men, but a whole group of men in this gay bar, I think for some people, it will, some people who lived through this period or who are familiar with history, LGBTQ history, it, it will, um, it will be less shocking, I think, than maybe some people who are not as aware of that time period. You know, a, a coming out story, as you said, is much different today. And the fact that they were arrested simply for being in a bar and, um, being suspected of being gay is, going to seem crazy to some people. Can you talk a little bit about just that period in history and what, why you wanted to write about it? Yeah. So, you know, in the, uh, really after World War II, uh, the mobilization of so many men and women, um, uh, made the possibility, made queer community possible. Uh, and, uh, so, you know, queer men and women were finding each other. Um, by 1962, we still hadn't really built communities with, uh, you know, with media and, uh, you know, um, culture was still pretty underground because as all of that happened, there was a backlash. Um, and so, um, lots of anti-gay laws, disorderly conduct laws, uh, lewd, uh, lewd vagrancy laws, uh, sodomy laws were, were enforced, um, uh, pretty aggressively in New York City between, um, 19, Oh, what are the dates? It's 1933, I think, in 1966, something like 50,000 men were arrested um, uh, for, uh, uh, you know, disorderly conduct. Um, and essentially just simply being gay, either they were dancing with another man or they were wearing the wrong clothing or they made the wrong gesture. So, uh, you know, queer people had to live in secrecy. Uh, they had to be careful who they told. Um, they had to be careful how they associated. So it, it was really a very, very different world. But it's also a world right on the cusp of radical change, right? Seven years later, we have Stonewall. Uh, but in fact, throughout the 19, uh, the late 1950s, uh, and 1960s, you had a, a series of, uh, of, of, of uh, protests in Los Angeles and San Francisco and New York. Um, and gradually, you know, gay people were deciding to stand up for themselves and fight back. Uh, and so in a way, this is a story about three men who decide to stand up for themselves and fight back. It is time for our first break of this episode. Now that you have uh, an overview of the book, and that just seems like a really good place to stop. It's a story about three men who decide to stand up for themselves and fight back. That's the perfect place to go to the break. We're going to continue this conversation after the break. Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. 
you want to be healthier, yet you just don't know what to do. All these shows telling you this and that, but nothing seems to work. Well, listen close. Golden State Media Concepts has got something great for you. The health and wellness podcast dedicated to workout trends, healthy eating habits, diet, and everything about healthy living. Join us in our banters as we help you not just live life to the fullest, but live it to the healthiest. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with Edward Cahill about his novel, Disorderly Men. Before the break, he had just described what the book is about, given an overview, and concluded with it is a story about three men who um, decide to stand up for themselves and fight back. And they all do that in different ways. But just to remind you of that so we can go into this next part of the conversation. Because this... just the simple act of going to a bar on a night, a certain night, they're arrested. It could have absolutely, you know, and, and it changes their lives, but it could have absolutely ruined their lives in so many different ways. I think we have a long way to go with LGBTQ rights in the world today, but at least there has been progress in that regard. Well, yeah, you know, I think one of the reasons we're seeing um, another backlash right now in in 2023, there were more anti-gay laws passed at the state level um, than ever before. And the reason is, I think, because we have made so much progress. Now, I think that progress is, uh, you know, it's 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 local and regional. There are some places where it is still very much not okay to be gay um, and where it's still very, very hard to grow up gay. Uh, but but yeah, there has been there's been a, a ton of progress. And I, I hope kind of one of the things that that my book um, shows people is that uh, is that this this history of oppression is really very, very recent. Um, so I think it's something we can be we can be proud of, but certainly not something we want to take for granted either. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, so you mentioned that this is told from the points of view of three different men in the story, um, Roger, Julian, and Danny. Can you talk about each of them a little bit and how they might resonate with readers? Sure. So Roger is, um, no, you, you know, for, uh, something I want to say first is that Roger, Julian, and Danny are cis white men. Uh, they don't represent the, the the diversity of queer experience in New York City in 1962. But they're three characters that I knew how to write. Roger is, uh, he's a banker. Uh, he's a Westchester family man. He's got two kids. He's got a wife. Uh, and he is as in the closet as you can be. Um, Julian is a, a Columbia literature professor, um, uh, a Shakespeare professor. And um, he's got a pretty complicated uh, life, but he's relatively out if one can be out in 1962, which was always a relative thing. He's got gay friends um, and he's just fallen in love with uh, with a young man. Um, as our story begins. Um, and then Danny is an, an Irish um, grocery clerk who lives in the Bronx. Um, uh, and he's got a lot less to lose than these two. And so when when he's arrested, um, his his response is uh, is a bit more radical. And um, as the other as uh, Roger and Danny are trying to figure out how to uh, preserve both their lives and their integrity, Danny is trying to figure out how to uh, how to make progress in the world um, and, uh, and, uh, and 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 considering his radical options. And he has a different experience than the other two in terms of the arrest and what happens afterwards. And I, of course, don't want to give a lot away, but um, it's, it's it's understandable the direction that he goes in from what happened to him that night. Yeah, I think, um, you, you know, Roger and Julian are both dealing with a lot of fear and a lot of shame. Uh, but Danny really is dealing with anger. He's um, it, it, he was such an interesting character to write because, um, you know, he's in his early 20s. Uh, he's relatively unformed. He's he's had a he's had a pretty easy go of it. 
Um, and then suddenly he's not having an easy go of it, but he's resourceful um, and uh, and he's smart. And he he comes to realize that that fighting back uh, against this system that he's he's sort of discovering is in place to oppress him uh, becomes becomes his goal. You know, so many of the stories about queer lives uh, that were told in the mid-century period end up with suicides um, or, you know, queer characters um, either dying or sort of fading into obscurity, um, ending very pessimistically. And I wanted to tell uh, a story that took place in that same time, that same very, very difficult time um, where people didn't know very much and they were often quite afraid. They had very few resources um, where the characters um, had the courage to stand up and fight back. Because I think the history of queer people in the 20th century was often a history of fighting back. We don't see it because we know it was also a history of hiding in the shadows. So many of the queer stories uh, from the, that period, you know, the well of loneliness, um, uh, the city and the pillar, the children's hour, they end really, really badly. Um, and I wanted to, uh, I wanted to tell a story that, that had some hope uh, um, in it that, um, that, that showed queer people really believing that their lives were worth fighting for and that, um, and that they had the courage to do it. You know, I think if you're, if you grow up as a gay kid, uh, it becomes a bit of a fantasy to stand up and fight back against the bullies who oppress you. Um, you know, it's the thing that you imagine one day you're going to do. Um, and, um, so, you know, perhaps there's a touch of wish fulfillment here, but I think it's also, it's also historical. Queer people have stood up and fought back. Um, and so I wanted to imagine what it would actually be like to do that and how difficult it would be and how scary, uh, it would be to do that, but also how inspiring, um, given how bleak, uh, you know, the world looks to these three men, um, at the time that they're arrested. Um, and, uh, and and how much ingenuity it takes to figure out how to get to the other side of it. And you said, you know, maybe it's <laughs> wish fulfillment. <laughs> but at the same time, I think it, as a as a kid growing up gay and, and, and wanting to to grow up and fight back at some point, it's important not only to have that representation of seeing yourself in books, but also to have that hope that, you know what, it's not going to be easy, but here's a story that might inspire me to be able to do that one day and, and to know how difficult it might be, but also to know that it is possible. Yeah, yeah, it's possible. And there, that there really is a legacy of it. You know, in 1962, the same year uh, that my story is told in Madison Square Garden, um, there was a boxer named Emil Griffith, and he was gay. And an opponent made anti-gay slurs um, at him in the fight, and he beat him to death. And, you know, it's it's not exactly a model of resistance uh, uh, I, I would want to advocate. Uh, but on the other hand, um, you know, it was uh, it was a story that got a lot of media attention at the time. And um, and, you know, it it it. I think it stands as a reminder that uh, that queer people are people and people, when you push them too far, are going to fight back. Absolutely. And it's also, um, I think we hear a lot about with the current wave of, of anti-gay sentiment and anti-gay legislation, you know, that, well, this just, this just didn't exist in my time. Well, it did. It people were just so very hidden because they had to be, um, and you know, it's, it's so it's good in that way to to tell the stories and to know that that, that they have existed throughout history. Um, relationships have existed throughout history. Well, yeah, I mean, so many uh, so many of the great writers um, uh, in in the English tradition um, and lots of other traditions too, uh, you know, were gay. And I think I think gay history is is having a real moment now. Uh, I feel lucky that my book is coming out uh, at a time when um, there's a, a, a lot of uh, gay historical novels coming out that are really very, very good. Um, there's a uh, you know limited series on uh, you know streaming and films. Um, I think we're we're at a moment, and maybe it's because of the political progress we've made, where um, where you know culture producers are are saying it's time for these stories to be told uh, and that there's a lot of interest and it's interest that goes beyond gay audiences i think that's probably the most important thing and in terms of um 
going beyond gay audiences, queer audiences, et cetera, what do you hope that just the average reader might take away from the book? The the book probably has a politics, and I'm sure uh, you know it's a pro gay politics. But but ultimately, it's a story about three uh, three uh, characters who are in a trial for their lives. And uh, you know, I think coming out stories are always existential trials. Um, everything is at stake uh, if you believe that coming out could be the end of you. Um, and so facing who you are, facing your your internalized shame and uh, and your you know external oppression is um, uh, is is a really interesting and dramatic thing. Um, so I want I want uh, people who don't know about that uh, that confrontation of uh, of self and other uh, to to get a sense of what it might have felt like. Um, in the most under the most difficult of circumstances, um, I think these are characters who who have a lot of shame that they have to confront. And I think you know people, a lot of people carry a lot of shame. So this is a story about confronting shame. It's a story about confronting fear, and it's a story about um, about love and finding the capacity to love um, and the courage to love in in a context that doesn't seem so um, so hospitable for it. When it comes to your characters and, and writing those characters, how does that process work for you? Do you like to have a really good character sketch before you start writing, or do you prefer to have them evolve as you write, or a combination thereof? You know, I, I talk about this with my students, and um, writing character is so interesting. Uh, it's you know, it's so important, um, but it's almost impossible. I think, at least, it is impossible for me to imagine a character fully formed. And the only way a character really becomes a character is if you build if you build him uh, and you build him out of habits and um, tendencies and um, actions uh, and reactions and thoughts and, um, you know, dialogue. And, um, you know, I had I had an idea for Roger, Julian and Danny, um, but I didn't really come to know them until I'd been working on the novel for about a year. And once enough of those pieces were in place. You know, just decisions. You know, um, I'm I'm going to give uh, Julian this habit. I'm going to give Roger that tendency. Um, I'm going to have Danny do this. And then I finally began to see who they really are, and at that point, I could know how they would respond in any situation. But it it certainly did take a while. Um, you know, I knew Roger was going to uh, be a banker, and Julian was going to be a Shakespeare professor, and Danny was going to be a grocery clerk. Uh, but I hadn't yet figured out. Um, how they would respond to the world, um, and that that took a while. But but it, it really is a it's it's something that one constructs. I think uh, at least for me, um, and it, and it takes a while. And and there's something even sort of strangely um, logical about it. You know, once once you have a kind of a critical mass of uh, of habits and attributes, that character becomes a real person. It is time for our second break of this episode. When we come back, more about characters and character development. Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play.
Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and my conversation with Edward Cahill. Before the break, Edward was talking about characters and character development, and let's go ahead and pick up that conversation again. Well, and one thing that I, I smiled about is the, the the character of Gus. Early in the book, this is just a random comment, but he he just dropped the word ope into a sentence, and Gus is from the Midwest, and that, for some reason, just made me smile a lot because that's so very midwestern and it's not a huge it's not an important detail but it 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 was true to his character and it it made me smile so um take that as you will i i love that i did an awful lot of research on that and i wanted to i I tried really hard to get it right without it being too obtrusive uh but it, it it for me it was just some little tick of gus's that made him kind of extra adorable and um uh, and and not of New York City, and I wanted him to be not of New York City. Uh, so thank you so much for noticing that. <laughs> it was a very non-New York City <laughs> word uh, phrasing of of, of things. Um, how about research? I'm sure you did a lot of research uh, for the story and the book. What stands out for you in terms of research? You know, I'm I'm a trained researcher, uh, so I know how to do lots of research, and I love doing research. So I could do it for days, for weeks, for for months, for years. Um, uh, but when I started this project, uh, I I made the decision not to spend a year doing research on 1962 in New York City. Um, I, you know, I read Fred Kaplan's book 1959, which was really really useful. Um, uh, James Baldwin's Another Country is one of my favorite books um, that takes place in New York City around the same time. I'd read so many books and seen so many films that I had a, a sense of what this period was like. Um, and because I'm I'm a historian, um, a lot of a lot of my research was to make sure that my sense was historically accurate. But I didn't want to lead with the research. You know, there's sort of if you're a historical novelist and your research, you kind of wear your research on your sleeve. You failed. Um, and, you know, people notice that and I, I would never want to do that. I want I want my research to be absolutely invisible. So what I would really kind of aim for is to is to to go for an impression, right, a feeling, an effect that felt like 1962. And then I just had to make sure that, in fact, um, that's exactly how it would have happened, um, that, you know, that that didn't happen two or three years later, um, that uh, this is what people were doing in New York City. Um there's a there's a mid-century feeling that I really wanted to achieve with this novel uh, that's just so very different from, uh, you know, our contemporary lives. Um, and I think I manifest that not only in, you know, plot details and description of places and, you know, current events, uh, but also in, uh, you know, in language um, and the way characters speak and uh, and the way that they think about the world. So, you know, r- rather than going for a factually... Um, uh, true 1962. I really wanted to to deliver the feel of 1962, and then just make sure I didn't make any mistakes. And I think that's important because <laughs> just simple simple details, for instance, like um, Danny's pompadour, or um, you know, just the different different details of clothing or um, certain words, again, with, with just simple words from that phrase can really ev- evoke that, that time period. Yeah. And I think, you, you know, the, the, you know, setting is really important, but I tend to funnel everything through character. So, um, you know, I, uh, if, 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 you know, Danny is going to manifest 1962 uh, through his pompadour, uh, that, that pompadour really needs to be a part of who he is. Um, and, uh, you know, if they make a reference to a play that they saw or a film that they saw, um, you know, they like to be, cam- uh, um, uh, Danny, um, and Gabriel, uh, his friend like to be very campy. Um, uh, those, those moments really are character moments. You know, the, 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 this is the kind of, uh, man that he is. Um, and, uh, you know, it's it's a secondary effect that it uh, that it reminds the reader that uh, this is all happening in 1962. But really, it's happening to this character. These things, uh, these details uh, emerge because they're there's something that this character cares about, that this character notices, that this character thinks is important. 
Right, which is important when it's uh, when it's character driven, um, it, rather than than plot driven or even location driven. Um, you can you can you can still get that sense of plot and location through the characters and their actions and the way they speak. So, what do you think it is about this this genre of historical fiction that draws you to write within it? Um. I mean, I'm a historicist. Um, I want to know where everything comes from. Um, I think I've always been a bit of an anachronism um, as a as a human being. Um, I've been drawn to earlier times, not always understanding my own historical moment very well. Um, I think as a writer, uh, you know, I mean, I, I've spent the, the last, uh, you know, 20 plus years teaching uh, 18th and 19th century literature. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's a there's a way of making sentences uh, that that we just don't really uh, we don't really engage in anymore. Um, that's always been just so pleasing to me. Um, I love, in particular, you know, the mid-century style. Uh, you know, John Cheever and um, uh, you know Richard Yates. I love that. Uh, uh, you know, Baldwin for sure. I love that style. Um, and um, you know, I wanted in this novel to 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 create um, a, a kind of pastiche of the of the mid century novel uh, to make it really sound like uh, like like it was a novel from uh, you know from the mid century because it's just it's just so appealing to me. Um, you know, I've, I've I've done a little bit of uh, writing mostly in short fiction uh, that's much more contemporary, uh, and it it just feels like a whole different kind of thing. I love being I love being in uh, in the the historical past. Um, and, um, and I think imagining worlds that, that we think we know, uh, and then sort of delivering some surprises because, you know, the, one of the ways we come to history is through, uh, through, you know, uh, sort of caricatures. You know, we, we think of the 1950s as this, this sort of morally rigid time. In fact, the 1950s, there's so much experimentation going on. Um, and so it's 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 interesting to be in a historical moment and then kind of uncover the aspects of it that uh, that readers might not be so familiar with. Yeah. Are there other writings that you would like to highlight during our time together? Well, I have a, a, a short story called The Ice Cube that is going to be in the Saints and Sinners anthology um, uh, from the uh, Saints and Sinners Literary Festival in um in New Orleans, uh, where I'll be in March, uh, also at the uh, Tennessee Williams Festival, uh, promoting Disorderly Men. Um, uh, it's actually my first published short story, um, so I'm excited about that. Uh, and and it's a uh, it's it's a contemporary story. Um, but the the book that I'm working on right now um, is uh, is another historical novel, and yet it's not set in the mid century period. It's actually set in uh, colonial Boston. Um, I, you know, I, I uh, spent a lot of time as a, a scholar thinking about uh, colonial Boston um, and, uh, you know, colonial British America. And when I stopped doing scholarship uh, about eight years ago, I kind of swore I'd never work on that material again. But as I was casting about for a second book, I found myself just drawn to um, drawn to the period, drawn to the language. Uh, and drawn to the the kind of the satirical possibility of um of thinking about, you know, uh, what's now U.S. culture uh, at this very nascent stage uh, and having an awful lot of fun with it. So uh, so that's what I'm working on right now, but it's still early days. I love that. That's just like, very different from the, the, the time period of, of this, the current book. Well, it, you know, it, it, the, as I was thinking about a second novel, I, I, I love this mid-century period. Um, and I uh, had so many ideas uh, for narrating the struggle of queer people. Uh, and there's so many, so many different possibilities. But uh, that I, I just found myself thinking, you know, I want to grow as a writer. Uh, I want new challenges. Um, um, there's no, there's going to be no sequel to Disorderly Men. Um, uh, I'm not sorry to say um, those characters, uh, their stories end where, where, where the novel ends. Um, and um and I, I, you know, series are very popular these days and series do really well because readers like to return to the same characters. Um, but I, I feel like I want to grow as a writer. And so uh, the the book I'm working on right now is very, very different. It's not a gay novel exactly, but it's still a little gay. 
Well, and I, I would imagine it's nice to challenge yourself. I know for myself, staying in my comfort zone can be very tempting. So to, you know, you know, just stay within that mid-century novel. I, I, I wrote it. I liked it. I was great there, you know, but to challenge yourself to write in a different time period and, uh, in a, in a different setting, I think is probably important. I think one of the most exciting things about writing novels for me is uh, the, the the moments, and sometimes they last a while, where you're not sure you can actually do it, where it's you feel like you may have bitten off more than you can chew. Um, and I wouldn't want to be in any other place because I know if it's going to be good, if it's going to be worth my time, if it's going to be worth a reader's time, um, then it it has to it has to be um, it has to be that much of a challenge. Uh, and and so it's it, it's very exciting at this point where, I, you know, to have an idea of a novel that feels at this point too difficult for me to pull off. Um, I think in the end, I have confidence that I will be able to pull it off. But right now, I, I, I don't know how. That's terrifying, but also a little exciting because I'm not you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of writing, it's clear from your profession that books are important to you, probably always have been. What was the impetus that made you decide you wanted to try writing for publication? Out of college, I waited tables and I wrote short stories um, and I had no luck um, and I really didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know the difference between telling a good story and writing a good sentence. And I was very good at writing good sentences, but I didn't know how to tell stories. And I found myself um, kind of drawn into graduate school, and then I became a literature professor. And uh, I started publishing in a scholarship. And um, my first book uh, is about uh, the, uh, liter literary culture in the early United States. And, um, you know, it's all very, very interesting to me. Uh, it's a very different kind of writing. Um, it's a pretty limited audience. And I was in the middle of a second book. Um, sitting in the New York Public Library about eight years ago. And um, I was about halfway through this book. Um, uh, lots of, uh, you know, monographs in front of me, all my research in front of me. And I thought to the, the future where maybe 150, 200 people would read this book that I was pouring my heart and soul into. And a part of me said, I want a bigger audience. Um, so I pushed everything aside and I knew instantly I wanted to see if I could try to write a novel. So I wrote a couple of chapters um, and started to feel good about it. I wrote a few more. It started to take shape. And then I realized that, at that point that I was, in fact, writing a novel. It is time for our final break of this episode. When we come back, Edward will share his advice for authors. Uh, so stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast. Together we dive into the world of sci-fi and science fiction. From episodes of Star Trek, Star Wars, to The Walking Dead, Resident Evil, all the hot new science fiction movies from the back doors of Marvel or DC. The Golden State Media Concepts Sci-Fi Podcast. You'll never look at science fiction the same way again. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion of my interview with author Edward Cahill. From your experience then as a writer, as well as a, a literature professor, what advice would you have for aspiring authors? Well, you know, um, having written a book makes it so much easier to write a book. Um, um, a novel is a big project, so if you've ever handled a big project, you know, even if it's not a book, but it's just a big project with lots of moving parts. Um, it's good to have that experience because, uh, you know, a novel does require, you have to be in charge of a lot of information. You have to, you have to keep a lot of notes. You have to, you know, you have to have a calendar of events. You have to, you have to manage so much and it can be really overwhelming. Um, so my first piece of advice is, um, figure out how to not be overwhelmed by the scope of a novel because it can be very overwhelming. 
being organized certainly helps. Um, and having experience with big projects helps. Um, and patience, I think, too. Um, you know, it's it's very difficult to see um, a novel all at once. Um, and so just having patience and a little bit of faith that if you keep working at it, eventually it's going to come into view. I think the thing that I learned most writing Disorderly Men was that for me, um, uh, it didn't have to be good. The draft uh, that I wrote at the end of the day didn't have to be good. Um, if I if I kept the bar relatively low, I could keep writing and I could keep writing every single day. And I had to sort of relax that sensor in my brain that says it has to be perfect. It has to be perfect uh, because I think that sensor would have just discouraged me too much. So my uh, my my rule number one every day, it doesn't have to be good. And that really kind of taught me the confidence that I could make it good. It just didn't have to be good, you know, um, uh, in the first draft. I think that's so important because I think it's so easy to be overwhelmed with trying to get it right as opposed to just getting it written and then working on getting it right. Yeah, it takes time to get it right. And, you know, um, that first draft um, in so many ways is a record of your previous ignorance. You know, you didn't know what you were doing um, until you finished that first draft. That first draft taught you what you were doing, but now you've got this big mess on your hands. All of these moments where you've you've sort of written into the text you're not knowing what you were doing, right? Uh, so the, the draft is a tool to teach you what it is that you're trying to do. Um, and so, uh, you know, revision is the thing that turns that record of, of previous ignorance into something really good. Um, and I believe in revision. I revise and revise and revise. I'm sure I revised Disorderly Men 50 times, um, which took forever because it's, you know, uh, it's about 120,000 words maybe. But uh, but that was the only way I could do it, um, to to just keep coming back to it and seeing it and staying really intimate with it. I think I think one of the most important pieces I have for, for anyone trying to uh, of advice I have for anyone trying to write a novel is to stay with it, be close to it all the time. Because if you take breaks, you you lose that feeling of mastery, right? That feeling of of understanding exactly how everything should be. Um, so that when you're revising, you know when you've made a mistake, you know when you've missed an opportunity. If you step away for a, a while, you have to you have to kind of spend some time getting intimate with again, right? A novel is is you know is a little bit like a lover. You have to be in there close, and you have to and you have to know, and you have to pay attention. You have to devote the time. And when you have done that, you can be really attuned to what's going on and what needs fixing. You mentioned the organizational aspect of it, and everybody comes at this from their own perspective. For you, what's what's one of the main ways you keep yourself organized in terms of writing and all of that information that you have to manage? I wish that I um, had a, a better system than I do. I just have a whole bunch of Microsoft Word files uh, that uh, that I, uh, I I return to. I have a you know, I have a calendar so I know what's happening on every day um, so that if uh, if I have one character uh, doing something on a Saturday and it's raining, then when that other character comes in on a Saturday, it's still raining because it needs to be raining on that Saturday. Um, uh, you know, lots of biographies. I really want to know everything I can about about characters. Um, I want to know, you know, uh, how they've lived their lives and um, what their favorite things are. Uh, so keep lots of notes like that. Okay, fair enough. When you take time to read, just for you, um, what are your favorite genres and some of your favorite authors? I mean, I love gay literary fiction. Um, Alan Hollinghurst is one of my favorite authors. Calm to Bean, uh, one of my favorite authors. Um, I've been teaching a lot of uh, a lot of contemporary literature uh, at Fordham lately. Uh, in fact, I have a class now that I call very contemporary American fiction, and it's just novels that I I decide I want to read from uh, you know published within the last couple of years. Um, so uh, Ben Lerner is a, a a favorite of mine. Patricia Lockwood I've really liked. Um, Ocean Vong. Um, this year I'm going to read the new Justin Torres novel Blackouts and Emma Klein's The Guest. Uh, I think there's just so much exciting things happening in contemporary fiction right now. Um, I read uh, uh, 
uh, In Memoriam by Alice Wynn and just absolutely fell in love with it. Uh, Tom Crew has a novel called The New Life about two uh, sexologists in uh, in, um, in uh, late Victorian England uh, daring to publish uh, this uh, this innovative and controversial work. So there's so so much really good gay historical fiction being uh, being published right now, um, and uh, I, I think it's a, it's an exciting time for writers and certainly for readers. Thank you for that. In terms of internet presence, if in case people want to know more about the book, more about you, uh, if you have a website, if you can share that, as well as any social media that you're active on. Uh, sure. Yeah, they can go to Edward Cahill, all one word, dot net. Uh, that's my website. Um, and you can learn more about Disorderly Men and um, uh, my uh, my uh, public appearances. I'll be uh, at the... Um, Beacon Hill Books and Cafe uh, in February. Uh, that's in Boston. And uh, as I said, the Tennessee Williams Festival and Saints and Sinners Festival in New Orleans in March. I'm on Facebook and Instagram and uh, Twitter, now known as X. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much for joining me to talk about disorderly men and writing. I really appreciate the time you took. Thank you. It's been my pleasure, Sarah. Thank you again to Edward for joining me to talk about disorderly men and writing. If you are a fan of historical fiction, of character-driven novels, uh, if you're at all interested in the history of this time for the LGBTQIA plus community, it's incredibly important history. And this novel, I think, really gives you a good insight, not only into that history, but also the just the political climate of the time, the feelings of the time, through the actions and reactions of the three main characters of this book. It's it's a really good look at this time period in history and helps to explain what is going on with that community today as well. So um, definitely a, a must read for a lot of people. If you are interested, you should definitely check it out. If you have someone in your life who might be interested in this particular book, then get it for them as whatever present. I don't know, Valentine's Day is coming up. Or just because, hey, it's Tuesday, here's a book. Those are my favorite kinds of presents. Definitely check this book out. And um, you can follow Edward on the, you can find his website and the social media, etc. if you want to know more or looking for more information after hearing this interview. We have another episode coming up on Friday. Yes, we do. That interview is done. <laughs> it was another one that I talked about the last episode that got rescheduled a couple of times, but it happened and that is good. So I will be speaking to two authors and twins first time to have sibling nope i already had brothers on the podcast once but this time it is sisters and they are identical twins argita and detina zali will be joining me to talk about their memoir good morning hope so join me for that episode on friday of course if you uh follow like subscribe on the platform on which you are listening then you will be notified when there are new episodes so it will not it will take all of the guesswork out of your listening experience you will know when there are new episodes even when my schedule gets a little bit wonky you will know when there are new episodes uh, you can also leave a review on that platform if you would be so kind. Written, starred, one sentence, one paragraph, whatever it is in you to leave as a review, it helps. And I am grateful for that help because it gets the podcast out to more listeners. So thank you in advance for that. And also social media, if you want to follow the podcast, you can do so on Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram. Love hearing from listeners. I know I say that every week, but... It's because I do love hearing from you. So um, find the podcast and by extension me on social media and let me know what you are reading. Have you read some of the books of, from the authors that I interview? Has one of these interviews inspired you to go get that book and read it? What were your thoughts, etc.? Love hearing from you. So please do find me on social media. Me being the book, the book podcast, of course. I hope you're having a great week so far. I am looking forward to speaking to you again on Friday. In the meantime, stay warm wherever you are and find yourself plenty of time to wrap up in a blanket, get yourself a hot beverage, and get lost in a good book. Thank you so much.
You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.